This instructional video is designed to show you how to set up an FTP server on a computer as well as do a remote archive using an Invensys Zero Therm 6100 series data recorder. The software that I'm going to be using for this instructional video is called FileZilla. I'm sure most of you have heard of it at one point in time. But it is open source and free software that you can find easily on the web by just doing a simple search for FileZilla. Otherwise type in FileZilla-project.org and it will bring you to a site that you see in front of you right now. What we actually want to download is the FileZilla server, not the client. We want the server because that's going to be the software that's running in the background uh, in order to do this whole entire process. So uh, feel free to download uh, what you see right in front of you. It's about a meg and a half download. Uh, once you're complete, I'll go ahead and run the setup file. So the first screen that you have in front of you, this is your uh, basically just talking about what you're entitled to license-wise. Um, after you read through the entire thing, go ahead and press I agree. Uh, I would recommend doing the standard install. Um, you do have a couple of different options, but I would suggest doing the standard install. Choose a location that you want to have it installed to. Let's talk about this for a second here. This is regarding how FileZilla is going to be started. Now you have a couple different options. You can install it as a service automatically, manual, or you can choose not to install it as a service. If this is going to be something that you're running all the time and you're not going to have a lot of interaction with it, I would suggest doing the first option, which is installing as a service, start it with Windows. Otherwise, if you don't, you'll have to go in and start it every time you want to run it. And ideally, if it's going to be acting like a server, you probably want to have this going at all times. Uh, the software is not very large. doesn't use a lot of resources. Um, so to be completely honest with you, the first option is what I would recommend. In terms of the port, go ahead and leave it at 14147. And then I'd also suggest making sure that you have the box next to Start Server After Setup Completes checked. When you're done, go ahead and hit Next. This screen talks about uh, the interface. Uh, because the FTP server is running in the background, you do need an interface of some sort uh, to make user accounts, to monitor traffic, etc. This is the one point during the install that I would actually recommend not doing the default and setting it to manually. The reason why I say that is that this is an interface, you're not going to be using it very often. The only times you will use it is to create user accounts, which will likely only be for just one recorder, uh, or if you want to monitor traffic going on. There's no reason for it to start every time you start Windows. Uh, you can just manually go into your start menu and start the interface. However, once it is complete, I would recommend um, checking this boss to make sure that it does start up. That's pretty much it. Go ahead and click on install. When it takes about five to seven seconds and the program is installed. Go ahead and hit on close. And you won't see this window when it pops up. You actually get a different window. Uh, it says 127.0.0.1. Uh, and then it asks you for a password, which there is none. So you just hit OK. Then you will get the screen. The reason I see this is because I've already had the software installed on my PC. It's a very simple interface couple of icons going across the top here. Um, as I scroll over, over each icon, you'll notice in the bottom left hand corner, um, basically it will show you uh, what each icon is. What we want to click on is the user account dialog, which uh, I've got highlighted right now. When I go into that, you're going to get a screen just like this. Not a lot going on here. Um, that's because we don't have any users added. So let's go ahead and add a user first. This is the account that the recorder is going to utilize when it logs on to the server. So let's go ahead and hit add. It's going to ask us for the name of the user account we want to use. Uh, for this example, let's go ahead and just use the name uh, demo, for example. Go ahead and hit OK. And then you are presented with the following. The account is automatically enabled. Uh, unchecking this will obviously disable the account. And then you have the option to set up a password. This is completely optional. Um, to be honest with you, I don't normally use passwords for uh, recorder pushing data. However, if you want to add one, feel free to do so. On the left-hand side underneath page, uh, we're currently on the general. Uh, let's go ahead and look at shared folders. Now, shared folders are, well, just like it says, the folders that are going to be used for uh, the data coming from the recorder. If you don't already have a folder created where you want the data to go to, you need to create it before doing so. I did happen to make a folder already, 
I believe I called it data. So I can just add that directory by clicking on the add button, navigating to my C drive, and clicking on data. Hit OK. And a couple things now pop up. Obviously I have my directory, which is my C drive data folder. There's an H right next to it. That indicates that is your home directory. Meaning when you log in, that is going to act as your root drive. You will not see any other folders. Uh, you'll only be presented with one location, which is your data. On the right hand side, you've got a couple of different attributes you can associate with. Uh, right now it's only read only. Because you're going to be pushing over files, you need to give it write access. There's really no reason why you need this to assign, delete, or append as the reader, recorder can't do that. But I suggest um, leaving that as is. You can check it if you want to, but uh, really what you have in front of you is what's the only thing that needs to be uh, checked. Um, for the most part, that's pretty much it. You can impose speed limits if needed, but that's really not of a concern. For the most part, I say you're, you're pretty much set up from the computer aspect of this. When you're done, go ahead and hit OK. It's going to say that it's basically updating your uh, configuration, which it has, and we're done. That's really all that's needed. Now, nine times out of ten, you can close out this window. It's not really needed. However, I am going to leave this up and running because I want to show you what it looks like when we try to do a demand archive uh, from the recorder to the server. Okay, next we're going to look at the recorder using Bridge. If you've watched any of my other videos in the past, Bridge is remote viewing software for the 6000 series. Right now, we're looking at roughly six points uh, of data on the 6100A. Um, just doing a couple of test uh, sine waves here. And um, what we need to do is we need to go into the configuration and set up a couple of the uh, parameters for connecting to the FTP server. So the first thing we need to do is we need to be logged in as an engineer. In the upper left hand corner there's a button that says logged out. This is where we actually log into the recorder. So if we click on this, it's going to bring the login window. And then from the drop down we can select what user we want. These are the default um, levels that you can use. Obviously you can have additional users, but you do need to be logged in to an engineer account or an account um, that's given the ability to make changes to the configuration. So I'm going to log into engineer. Default password is 100. And now that I'm logged into engineer, you'll notice that it changes from logged out to engineer. In the lower right hand side, we've got five boxes. Uh, this is our root menu. Uh, what we want to do from here is click on operator and it's going to bring up our operator menu. Now, again, if you've seen some of my previous um, instructional videos, uh, also in, in the last one that I did regarding the demand archive to local media, you're probably familiar with the screen where you went to local, I'm sorry, archive and then local. You chose where you wanted to do the archive to, whether it was your compact flash card or your USB stick. Choosing what interval you want to archive and then archiving that media. That was a pretty straightforward approach, and for the most part, it's really the same kind of concept for doing a demand archive to an FTP server. Instead of going to local, you go to remote, and, and again, you choose what interval. Do you want to archive the last hour's worth of data, last day, do you just want to bring it up to date? I do want to point out that the difference between bringing archive up to date and archiving all means that bringing archive up to date will look at the last archive date which was today, uh, roughly five hours ago. So we go back to that time and everything after that date, pull it over to the FTP server. Whereas the archive all will look at the internal memory and just pull everything that it can from it. Uh, probably the most obvious benefit of doing one over the other is that bringing archive up to date will be significantly quicker. However, the benefit of doing archive all is it will make sure that it's going to copy all data that you possibly have. So something to keep in mind. Now in order to do this um, archive you do have to set up some parameters for the FTP server. So what we do is click on config, go down to archive, and now we're at our archive settings. This menu is also used for setting up automatic archives um, if desired. So let's first go down a little bit here. Underneath where it says show, it's, we're looking at local settings. Let's take a look at the remote settings and a couple of different boxes populate. Archive to remote. This is what I talked about uh, just a couple of minutes ago uh, regarding the automatic archive. 
When it's set to none, that means it will not push the data to the FTP server on an automatic basis. However, if we change it to one of these other intervals, it will try to connect the FTP server and push the data. This is a great way to make sure that it's always backing up data uh, at specific intervals. However, keep in mind if the server's down for whatever reason, you will get errors and the error will not clear until you successfully do a uh, successful transfer. Uh, for this example, we're gonna leave it to none for right now because we don't wanna do any automatic archiving. FTP file format, you have three different choices. You can archive the binary data, which is your encrypted UHH data. You can push over the CSV data, which is your uh, non-secured Excel data, or you have the ability to send over both file types. Um, the option is completely up to you. Um, you know, if you want to play it safe, you can do both binary and CSV. The only difference, it will take a little bit longer to push everything over. So that's completely optional for this um, video, however, I will only be transferring over binary. Okay, that being said, now we've got a couple other things we've got to put in here. Remote path. The remote path refers to the location on the server that we're going to send the files. Now, because a couple of minutes ago we already set up the home path as being my C drive slash data, there's no other folders within that directory that we need to write to. If I had made my directory the C drive and not told the server that I want to go into the data folder, I would have had to type this, sorry, that. Meaning when it logs onto the server, it's going to go to that folder. But again, I've already set up in the server that it's going to go to this folder by default. So I don't need to put anything in the remote path. Keep that in mind. If we're setting it up the way that I've shown you, there's no reason for you to put anything into the remote path. Leave it blank. The primary remote host is the IP address of the uh, com computer that you're connecting to. And just to make sure that I know what IP address I'm connecting to, I'm going to type in CMD, bring in my command, and then type in IP config. And as you can see here, this is the IP address of my computer, so I'm going to place that as the address. So 192.168.111.100. The primary login name is going to be demo. That is what we set up previously. We didn't assign a password, so we can leave that blank. And then the secondary mode host, login name, etc., is essentially just a backup server. If you're running two different servers somewhere, one of them's down, it will try to connect to the secondary server um, as a kind of a safe hold. Um, again, we're not using one, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that blank. So going through again, we're showing remote settings. We're only sending over binary data. Uh, we're going to the home path, so I don't need to put anything additional here. This is the IP address uh, of the server, my user account, and I don't have any passwords. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit apply. You'll notice everything's red that I've changed. When I hit apply, it will turn black. Okay, so it's turned black. Uh, it's been accepted, and now we should technically be set up. Let's go ahead and test this setup real quick. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller here. Now, what I've got on the screen is two different views here. I've got my recorder view as well as my server interface. <clears throat> what I should be able to do now is go to archive and remote. Choose what interval I want to archive. Let's just say um, we'll archive the last day's worth of data. When I click this button, you should notice on the right-hand side, well, you notice a couple things. Down below, archive transfer, transfer is going to turn to active. You're also going to see an FTP icon pop up in this uh, menu bar up here. And then on the right-hand side, you should see the IP address of the recorder logging in, uh, establishing communications, and then transferring data. So uh, the whole process will take several minutes. It does transfer only one file at a time. So when I run this, I will likely speed up the video, but I do want to show you how it works. Let's go ahead and click archive last day and see what happens.
Okay, so we finished up the archive and basically went through, uh, took all the binary encrypted data and uh, basically sent it over. There's a total of three files that were sent over. Uh, you can tell on the right hand side here uh, based on the interactions number one, number two, and number three. Basically what it does is it logs in, sends the first file, logs off, and logs back in. Uh, on your record you'll notice that it says demand archive finished and uh, as you can see that sent over about a day's worth of data. It did take a couple minutes to do. It is by far probably the slowest method for archiving uh, but really that's all that's needed in order to uh, do a demand archive. Let's take a look real quick and make sure the data is in the folder. Go to my C drive, go to data and there you go there's the three files, the UHH files. Uh, let's take a look here details yeah so they're roughly about uh, you know anywhere from uh, 380k to as small as 3k um, and that's all the data from the past day now you can take this information here the UHH files and import them into review so you can look at the um, you know the, the graphs reconstructed but uh, these UHH files are, are what um, makes the recorders 21 CFR part 11 compliant uh, encrypted unalterable data uh, one other quick thing that I want to talk about, um, if we want to do this automatically, if we went back to config, go to archive. Uh, again, we talked about archiving remote. Right now, if I change this to an hourly basis or, for example, a daily basis and hit apply. Now, what this means is that on every day, basically 24 hours from the last time we archived, it's going to archive the data again uh, for you automatically. So now, going forward, we don't have to worry about going to archive, remote, choosing what interval. We simply let this uh, recorder run and uh, it's going to automatically uh, connect to the FTP server for you and then you'll never have to worry about overriding old data. You always make sure you have redundant data and it really just takes all the, um, you know, the hard work out of it. So that's it. That's all that's needed for setting up an FTP server, uh, and that's all that's needed to push the data to the FTP server. I uh, appreciate you watching the video. Thank you.